This is our second one this year for the fall to do a parent chat through the Balance in Mind community. And we are so thrilled to be back online to help parents through this difficult time um, of COVID and everything else going on. Um, first of all, my name is Sherry Gazit. I'm a proud member of the Balance in Mind team. I'm also founder of TeenWise and MomWise. I'm a teen life coach and a parent strategist. And I'm just happy to be here to help facilitate this discussion. We have some amazing speakers tonight. I'm so glad that Andrea could be here. And um, she has been working as a substance use, substance use disorder professional and substance abuse education and prevention coordinator at Youth East Side Services for over 19 years. So she knows her stuff. She works at Redmond High School as a prevention intervention specialist where she currently sees students and families and runs three substance related support groups for students virtually. And that right there says um, we need these talks because that's a lot of kids that you're servicing there. Uh, Andrea also teaches the alcohol drug education, education class, runs the Uproads Pro Social Sober Support Group, Life Skills Group, and works as an outreach counselor with the Teen Center through partnership with the City of Bellevue and the Boys and Girls Club. Andrea, you are one busy lady. That's all I can say. That's a lot of stuff you're doing there. And we certainly appreciate all that you're doing to support the community and the teens and the kids and the parents. Um, they really need you. We also have Jerry Blackburn with us tonight. He's the executive director of the Influence the Choice Community Coalition and an adjunct faculty member in the Substance Use Disorder Counseling Education Program at Bellevue College. Jerry currently serves as board, as a board member for the Garage, the Issaquah Teen Cafe. I actually, I love that place and I love the initiative there. Um, of Parent Wiser, the PTSA Council Education Committee and the Greater Issaquah Equity and Inclusion Group. In 2005, he was honored by the Washington State Division of Alcohol and Substance Abuse with the Richard Rivera Passionate Youth Professional Award and in 2017, the Issaquah Schools Foundation presented him with the Golden Apple Award in appreciation for his dedication to the health of young people. Amazing, Jerry and Andrea. I'm so glad that both of you are with us tonight. Um, we are gonna jump in because we've got a lot to cover. Andrea, um, are you going first or Jerry? Who would like to start us off? I'm going first. Great. And I just got a notice that popped up that said my internet is unstable. So please interrupt me at any time if you cannot hear me and I'll turn my video off. Okay, right now you're looking great and I can hear you just fine. Perfect, okay. So go ahead with the next slide, please. Okay. So why do youth use substances in the first place? I think this is so important for us to mention simply because not all of the signs and symptoms are obvious and reasons are obvious, and some of them look just like plain old adolescents. And so I think, um, go ahead. I didn't realize this was, go ahead and click. <laughs> Sorry. And the next one. So stress, really. Uh, kids might start using because they have so much stress, they don't know how to deal with it. And, or to cover up other feelings like anxiety or depression, you know, young people's minds are still developing, their brains are still developing and growing. And so they don't actually possess the ability to deal with you know, some of these feelings and or situations. And so not yet, they don't have those. Um, and so go ahead, next one. Next. I'll just bring these, this first Thank row you. up. If that's Perfect. Okay. Um, and then, you know, rebellion, that's kind of what kids do. They push the envelope um, and it's just when they take it to the extreme and they go to use, you know, substances to actually rebel against, you know, the, um, the caregivers or parents in their lives. Um, also feeling grown up, you know, if you stop and think about all the commercials, all of the, um, you know, it's in movies, it's in videos, everything looking like grown ups are having fun while they're using and um, they may you know, wanna try that. And so that also goes along with social media, peer influence, curiosity, and fun. If you stop and think about how many social, uh, social media platforms there are out there and how much influencing is going on with your children, 
um, you know, making uh, it, using look fun, making it more appealing. Um, and so the curiosity factor, they may be curious about it and, oh, but they've seen something on, you know, um, social media that made it made it look more appealing. So they, you know, are going to give it a try. Um, it's just nice to be aware of some of these things. Um, and then you can't forget boredom. Boredom, I can't tell you how many um, young people we've heard from that say, um, I use because I'm bored, there's nothing to do, I don't have any money, I can't do this, I can't do that. Well, guess what, in the age of COVID, I mean, that is totally legitimate, um, saying that they're bored. However, there are um, things that you know, you can do or find for them to do or get more involved and get active um, with them to dispel that boredom so they don't end up choosing to use substances. So the flip side and to Andrew, why, yes? Go ahead. I was gonna say there's the combination right now of the boredom from COVID and then they're consuming more social media, more movies that portray teenagers as the norm doing drugs and alcohol. Right. And it's just like this melting pot and this like combustible pot, if you will. You know. Right, and it's this yeah vicious cycle. So the flip side to that is, why do some young people choose not to use? Because there, that is a, a very large number, um, and so it might be they don't want to disappoint their parents or caregivers, um, or maybe they're involved in extracurricular activities. Obviously, pre-COVID it looked a little bit different, being involved in you know drama, sports, bands, clubs. Um, and, uh, but there are virtual activities that can be, you know, that they can join at this point, um, even through school. And you cannot discount home activities with, with family members because I mean, those, are, those are huge. That's everything from, you know, maybe you have family night, maybe you have game night, movie night, um, you share meals together. And, um, or maybe just, you know, asking your child to go to the grocery store with you and you have conversations in the car with them. Um, so, so yeah, don't discount those conversations. And obviously, since COVID, all of that has been restricted more. However, there are also um, families that we've seen, you know, who have become more inventive with ways to, um, you know, be involved with their kids. Um, maybe uh, young people don't use because they don't want to get in trouble. So whatever that may be, whether it was at home or maybe school in the past. Um, or with the law, they don't want to risk their future goals, no matter what those goals are. Um, health risks, you know, kids are being inundated with prevention education. And so we're hoping that, that you know, sticks with them and that they choose to not use or not go down that path because of that. Um, and then are they genetically predisposed? So maybe they've learned about that and don't want to go down that path for that specific reason because they're more susceptible. And then maybe they just don't want to be like somebody they know or have seen who uses, abuses, or is addicted to substances. And that could be, you know, friends, acquaintances, uh, or family members. Okay, next. So signs and symptoms of use, what to look for. So we have the obvious signs, right? Smells. Okay, so you smell this very, um, you know, uh, uh, interesting smell or weird smell, pungent smell, you just can't quite put your finger on it, um, or these sweet smells like from vape juice. Um, and the one, the flip side to the smells is you have to remember that there's also smells to cover up those smells of using. And those could be incense, candles, um, um, cologne, perfume, you know, air fresheners, all those. So think about that. Um, you know, if you have interesting smells coming from your house or yard or whatnot, um, or on your child for that matter. Um, and then isolation, you know, we kind of have talked about that and, and, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's just so many people are feeling isolated, but this kind of goes above and beyond. So your child is no longer um, spending as much time or any time doing family activities or meals or with their siblings. Yeah, daddy, nigger, 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 
you're muted. I'm trying to find out who that was. Did anyone see yeah. me? No. no. Did they go off now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have. Um, yeah, we have it so that that person can't get back in. It doesn't mean that, that nobody else will try that, but Val, Bonnie, you're going to have to stay all on top of that. Yeah, all and right? if you do can tell who is um, is talking, if that happens again, but I'm going to put my positive vibe that it won't, um, yeah. just let me know. Okay, can you go back, please? Yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no worries. Right. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, okay, and so the isolation, just spending so much time behind closed doors um, or in different parts of the house by themselves, um, not wanting to get involved um, in any um, family activities and, you know, changes in behavior. That's, that's probably one of the biggest things is, you know what the baseline is as far as behavior goes for your child. So if you are noticing, you know, changes in that behavior, talk about it. And, and Jerry will actually, you know, talk a little bit more about that in his section, but, um, but just be aware of it and, and actually address it. Okay. And then you have the not so obvious signs. So changes in clothing. So all of a sudden your kids are wearing these t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats that have these, um, you know, pictures, words, or logos on them that you have never seen before or never heard of. Well, guess what? This is where Google comes in and you're going to do some research because the world is at your fingertips and you can learn so much by researching and finding out. It could be nothing, but it also could be, um, you know, drug encouraging behavior or language or, you know, pictures, that type of thing. So it's important to, to know what your kids are wearing and or promoting. Um, health supplements is another thing that was recently in one of our our um, trainings that we attend and, and it was just be aware all of a sudden your child is interested in um, taking health supplements when they've never been before and they're buying them online and you don't know what they are, um, you don't know what the ingredients are or whatnot, or even um, let's say your kid is carrying around an Advil or Tylenol bottle and you've seen it moved around the house so it's you know on his nightstand or or on her, uh, the couch on the kitchen counter, but you never actually see your child you you know taking the pills. It doesn't mean that you know it's not legitimately Tylenol, but just be aware. Um, just be aware and pay attention to the behavior that actually goes along with that as well. And then other items that you haven't seen before, look them up. There is a whole market out there. Um, that they are um, pinpointing young people who want to hide the fact that they're using substances. This could be everything from fake lipstick containers, fake soda cans, fake um, uh, cell phones or cell phone covers. Um, they even make bracelets that are actual pipes that you can smoke drugs out of. So just be aware. Okay. Andrea, can I ask you... Are there any health supplements in particular that we should watch out for? Um, no, they weren't actually listed, but I can um, I can do a little research and get that back to you. Great. Well, and we'll post that yeah, in the Facebook. Great. That'll be helpful. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Next, please. Next slide. And Stephanie asks a question: If we have any tips for conversation starters, we will get there. I promise. <laughs> yes. Okay. So. Um, what support is available from Youth Eastside Services for your children? So in all schools, and Christy Nicholson was here a couple of weeks ago and talked about this, um, but we have um, in the middle and high schools, we have our behavioral health support specialists and they're um, available for virtual office hours and brief contacts. And then also um, we can connect, you know, students to Youth Eastside Services um, like individuals and co-occurring, which is, you know, being able to um, work on both, um, address both mental health and substance use issues. And, um, you know, this would be for longer term or ongoing support. And also, are there any resources out in the community that could be helpful for the, for the students? Um, and then the link that up there is, you can go there and you can get any behavioral health support specialists 
uh, the schools they're in, the um, days they're there, or uh, excuse me, the office hours and the link to the office hours. And in the high schools, we actually have um, a few groups, the affected others groups, um, which is for young people who have been affected by a friend or a loved one's um, substance use recovery group. They want to work on staying sober or getting clean and sober. Uh, quit vaping now, which is our nicotine cessation. And then positive choices group, which is, uh, you know, learning all about healthy um, coping skills and tools. Um, in the middle schools, we have the trails coping with COVID group, along with um, coming soon social enga engagement groups. And then in our, um, and you can um, check with your school counselors or behavioral health support specialists to get your, connect your children with these services. Okay, and then why is our virtual support? We have our alcohol drug education class, which is one Saturday a month. We offer a three hour intervention class that teaches youth and their parents about the impact of substance use. And you can just register for that right online on our website. And we also have our Road to Recovery program, which includes motivationally youth-oriented approach to co-occurring treatment, as well as a parent component to the programming. And that's our, as you can see, the AWARE, the seven challenges, life in recovery, and includes the parent support. And you can find all that information at youtheastsideservices.org and even more information um, in more detail about the groups. And then, um, we refer you know, out to the community and you'll get a list of community resources, um, uh, access to links both from Jerry's and mine. And this is both for your children and your, um, you know, you as parents. And so lots of information. Um, I know I kind of, you know, went through that, but looking forward to hearing what Jerry has to say now. Excellent. From what I understand, Jerry, you have your own slides, is that right? I do, yeah. Can we unshare and then share? Yes, absolutely. And I just wanted to say thank you, Andrea, for that. Um, you know, the person who, who bombed us, so to speak, that was really um, disturbing. And for all of you that that really kind of hit your heart hard, um, you know, it happens. But I just want to acknowledge that that was not, not great. I mean, I don't want to just gloss over that. So yeah, um, agreed. And you wonder the necessity of us doing um, community work specific to race and equity and mm -hmm. for somebody to have the, you know, the, the necessity to do something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yes. It's definitely okay. disturbing. So Jerry, you are up. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you everybody and thank you. Andrea for um, setting all that up and um, and thank you to um, uh, the YES folks and it's so cool to see old friends on this on this chat and, and get to connect um, and so uh, my job I'm going to move a little bit upstream and, and talk about some of the mechanisms that we have in place to support parents and the community at large um, and this is super reduced because we're working with a, a limited period of time and so we'll get you resources because as we know there are tons and tons of risk and protective factors that we can explore and impact as community members as family members as clinicians and um, and uh, and work um, cumulatively to have better outcomes for our young people in the community. And so starting off thinking about some of the myths that we're exposed to that might dissuade um, parental engagement to some degree, um, I come across them a lot listening to parents in our community. Um, thinking about the levels of exposure that our children have, as Andrea pointed out, the majority of our young people don't use substances um, statistically. Um, so if you're encountering somebody that's uh, in your life that's, that is uh, absolutely certain that is not the case, that's a concerning data point for them to have and believe, right? So, um, but it's not, the reality is that our children are exposed in our community to substances and, um, and are navigating really, really difficult terrain, uh, regardless if we're in um, you know, isolation from COVID or out in the public. And so we wanna just be aware of that. And that's why we focus on risk and protective factors so that we can um, 
give them the skill sets and the capabilities to be successful out in their environment to manage the reality that they're experiencing. So again, the reality is that most young people don't use substances. They navigate adolescent development relatively well and come out the other side um, substance free. It's just not something that um, they succumb to in terms of social norms, um, uh, inaccurate expectations, things like that. So we do a relatively good job. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not problematic use um, and we need to address that, but that's pretty cool. Um, the idea that, and I have a 15 year old, so this really resonates for me as a, as a counselor and a, as a parent. Um, I sometimes believe that I don't have the capacity to do anything productive with my 15 year old. Um, but I, I really, I'm heartened by watching my 15 year old engage their environment and hear the things that they have been exposed to over time kind of resonate in their speaking. It might come out a little different. There's a whole lot of eyeliner and gloves without fingers, but it comes out, right? And, and so it's, it's encouraging. And so those conversations are something that we wanna have consistently. Kids actually do listen to us. Parental engagement and expectations and things are one of the most profound and productive uh, protective factors that we have. And so when parents lose that capacity or belief, it's really detrimental to the young person. So we want to encourage parents to, to maintain that. Also thinking about our own substance use and how that impacts our young person. Um, I think uh, as we've talked on this call already, thinking about social media and the exposure, um, uh, we know statistically that alcohol use particularly among adults, is rising in our communities, as is the presentation of alcohol use as both a stress management tool and as a mechanism for having fun. You know, and I notice that on my own social media feeds, you know, a friends of friends and stuff like that. A lot of the imagery is um, uh, parental imagery where we're, we're unfortunately giving them um, inaccurate perceptions, right? Um, a lot of our TV shows are like that. Um, we love watching Grey's Anatomy at my house, like, because there's lots of blood and saws and stuff like that. And my 15 year old loves it. But I'm always taken aback by that show's constant demonstration of alcohol use as the only mechanism for relieving stress, right? Every time something's difficult, they pop open tequila or go to Joe's bar or stuff. And so, so as, as parents, we have to think about what we're doing with our substance use. Um, you know, I would never indicate to anybody that they needed to change what they're doing in the community, but I want you to think about it and, and how you're demonstrating it, right? Are you coming home and really frustrated and the first thing we do is open the refrigerator and pop a, uh, a cork on a bottle of wine or do we take a walk or do we, you know, do some yoga or do some meditation? Thank you, Michelle. Um, like there's, there's alternatives that we can present in terms of health. Um, and then the parents who struggle um, uh, in our communities simply because they believe that they're being too strict and, and working with parents for so many years, you are in the majority. Our, the majority of parents want young people to make really healthy decisions regarding substance use. Unfortunately, in some cases, the parents that are struggling to hold those boundaries and are um, you know, reluctant to not purchase alcohol for their, their kids for, uh, you know, uh, home parties and stuff like that, they have a tendency to be louder. And so they unfortunately take a toll on the parents who are trying to make different kinds of decisions. So I think that's important. And the other side of that is what can we do from a prevention strategy standpoint to both increase protective factors and decrease risk factors. And, um, Thinking about the adolescent development process, prefrontal cortex versus limbic system, young people function in a limbic system world and their prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed. Prefrontal cortex executive functioning area is a stop switch. And so if we, they don't have a good stop mechanism, that's our job. So we want to help them through, you know, pro-social activities and specific expectations regarding substance use to delay any use as long as possible. Um, and again, most kids are capable of doing that. Um, Andrea also pointed out the genetics. Um, substance use disorders 
are, uh, for the most part, a genetic healthcare condition. So if you have a family history of substance use disorders, um, which I do, um, my significant little person is well aware that their genetic predisposition puts them at an 80% likelihood of having a uh, struggle with substances if they were to consume them, just because of their genetic makeup. Um, and so that's an important healthcare point to make sure that pediatricians know and dentists know and doctors know and stuff like that. Um, I think we've lost the capability of working cumulatively as, as individuals. Uh, one of my favorite comedians, uh, has this wonderful skit about like you know we don't even go to the mailbox anymore if we see our neighbor right we just kind of avoid eye contact and, and it's just a different world you know um how how parents are reluctant to share information when they know that somebody might be using substances um because they don't want that kid to get in trouble or they don't want to cause any waves and stuff and you know, when I was a kid, um, and I thought I would never say that as an adult, but here we are, um, like every parent on our street was able to yell at another child. <laughs> like, you know, if you saw something concerning, you said something and then you told the parents. And so I've told all of my parents, if you see my child in the community and they're not doing something appropriate or you're concerned, please let me know because obviously I don't. And I want that information. So thinking about ourselves as a village again, uh, you know, that we're all supporting the development of our young people, especially in crisis. Anything that we can do to create access barriers, making sure that organizations that sell alcohol are doing it in a, in a safe manner, um, locking up your own medications, even your over-the-counter medications. Um, when you think about um, maladaptive strategies that young people have for coping with adversity and crisis and discomfort, um, medicine cabinets are a, a great way to relieve that. And so we want to just make sure that that's not accessible to them. Um, thinking about what we can do in terms of community connections and competencies and confidence in our young people. And those are all resilience-based skills. I do lots of presentations in the community about developing resilience because I really think it's gotten lost in our, our last 10 years of, of um, myopic focus on academic success as the only success. And so our young people are getting to school and they're really, really smart, but they're really struggling to do anything with their education from a social emotional learning. And so now the Lake Washington School District has adopted social emotional learning curriculum um, with Character Strong. Um, the Issaquah School District has adopted social emotional learning. My 15 year old has it as a class every day because we realized that our young people needed to be able to regulate and have internal reward systems instead of external validation so that when they were confronted with a difficulty, they were capable of dealing with it, right? If our young people are always in a place where they're being externally rewarded, then they're not gonna have the skill sets to do anything productive with a difficult decision because they're looking for somebody else to tell them how to do it. So if we want really productive decision makers, we have to give them the skills to make really good decisions. And that's resilience-based stuff. And that's growth mindset stuff, right? Helping our young people manage challenge effectively and see uh, that sp stuff is supposed to be difficult. Uh, my uh, wife is a teacher in the Lake Washington School District, and, and she has that 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 mindset of helping young kids understand challenge. And I know that it's very sarcastic from her standpoint when the kids are like, this is hard. And she'd be like, mm-hmm, <laughs> like, yep. Like, get after it. It's supposed to be difficult. What do you need to be successful? How can we, how can we change that can't that you have in your mind to yet? Like, you can't do it yet. And so it allows people a venue and an avenue through difficulties and adversity, and they end up on the other side more productive. Um, one of the difficulties for my work in prevention and Andrea's work in prevention, and, and it's almost comical, is that young people have an inaccurate perception regarding the uh, use of their peers. They think that more of their peers are using substances than are, and at the same time, they think that parents care less than they actually do, and that's um, that specific information can be seen in the healthy use survey data. And so our jobs, my job, is to correct that misinformation with positive community norms campaign. Um, we just had our kids do a PSA video about the realities of substance use 
versus the perceptions of substance use. Because again, the majority of kids don't use substances. So if we're encouraging a social norm, they need to know that, guess what? Only about 10% of your friends are doing X, Y, and Z. So if you really want to be part of that social norm, here's how you do it. Um, and then again, for parents' side, we need to let them know that we really do care, that we're concerned about them potentially using substances. It's not an acceptable reality. It's not that we won't care about them and love them if they struggle, um, but we want to make sure that they know that, that here's the line. And if unfortunately you bounce over, then let me know what you need so I can help you and keep you safe because I care about you. Um, making sure that we're addressing in a growth mindset way, the idea of just entitlement. A lot of our young people um, struggle with the concept when they're given leeway in a certain avenue. So, um, you know, historically our worlds have always struggled with um, parents allowing young people to use alcohol socially at home and thinking that if they use it home, well, then they'll be less likely to use in the community. But the reality from a statistical standpoint is they're three times more likely to also use in the community. And so what we know is that young people, again, executive functioning, prefrontal cortex stuff, right? When they're given um, the leeway, they just take that leeway or that um, sense of entitlement to another place and make decisions based on that. Well, my parents don't care, I'm allowed to drink. And so they are in the community consuming as well. Anything that we can do to reduce the um, alienation and marginalization of, of young people in our community, because those populations are just more statistically um, uh, prone to uh, a host of maladaptive patterns of behavior and struggles, but substance use being one of those. And so the LGBTQ community, trans community, uh, all those communities um, are up against profound difficulties um, simply because they're not feeling part of our community. Um, again, we just had a glaring example of how race is playing out in our communities where people of color who um, you know are just not part of the dominant structures are made to feel less than and dominated. Um, and so what can we do to change those dynamics? Setting and maintaining high standards for, again, acceptable behavior. Our young people absolutely listen to us and so that we can produce um, uh, conversations with them on a consistent basis about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and, and what they need to be uh, successful in terms of managing those expectations. We do it for everything else, right? Um, so why wouldn't we make those? And then thinking finally about where we exist developmentally um, in, in regards to our young person's growth. Yeah, I always like the idea of thinking of it as a scaffolding, is that we provide a scaffolding around them that's developmentally appropriate, and the scaffolding gets bigger or smaller, um, specific to either their developmental capabilities or decisions they're making that are potentially healthy or unhealthy. So we might have to reduce the scaffolding, right? What's around them? It allows them to feel safe. If you've ever noticed, if you're a parent or a caregiver, um, if you have had a child who's been in a situation where they made a bad decision and you, you know, you put your care, parenting cape on and you were like, okay, here's what's going to happen. Here are the consequences. You notice after about a day of grumbling that they're much more communicative. They're much more comfortable because they realize they're safe, right? That somebody knows what I'm doing. Somebody cares about me. Um, so what can we do to make sure that our young person is aware that we exist in their world, right? We're there to manage um, what we need to manage for them that's developmentally appropriate and help manage them through that stuff. And this slide, believe it or not, I think was created when Christy Nicholson was on this call. Her and I did a presentation about 10 years ago for the Lake Washington School District. So I'll give her props for the slide because I've always just loved the simplicity of that message, right? That we can do a lot upstream to make sure that young people are successful and not using substances and, and being productive and learning and growing and being safe. And at the same time, substance use disorders are, are a treatable healthcare condition that require care and young people deserve that care. They're not bad people trying to get good. 
right? Um, and I think that's an important part of that too. So yeah, again, just a brief overview of some risk and protective factors um, that, uh, that we utilize in the work that we do in the community. So Jerry, as with a lot of stuff with our teens, it, it kind of comes down to, we need to have conversations with them about our values around it, about our expectations. We need to not enable them um, to drink and do drugs and kind of go along with this idea. There is a norm that kids are gonna be kids and try it and let's have them do it at my house so I can teach them the, the quote right way. Safe way. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I've actually had disagreements with um, people in our professions, you know, counselors and to have kids and they're like, no, we think we're going to, we have drinks at home with them regularly. We're teaching them how to consume responsibly. But you have to think of all the messaging that's going along with that, like you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And Christy just wrote equip rather than punish. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's consequences like you mentioned, but mm -hmm. again, it doesn't have to be done in anger or like you're grounded mm -hmm. for six months to a year, you know, <laughs> forever. We can't just take them out of society and think, okay, we've solved the problem, which is yeah. the easiest way, right? But it's not going to work. So exactly. Um, yeah, it's a collaborative thing and they've, they've got to make their choices. Okay, so um, I think right now, thank you, Jerry, for all of that great information. We're going to do a few things now. Um, we really listened to the community last from our events last year. And one of the things that people asked for was some more connection, more time to kind of talk about the content. So we are going to try something new tonight called breakout rooms. Some of you have probably done these in other um, events that you've been in online. And so we're gonna try doing this so that people feel more comfortable sharing. If you can go and change your name to just parent, then you don't have to worry so much about, oh, somebody might know my kid or they're gonna go talk about me. That is one thing that we do ask in this community is that you know the confidentiality that you don't take things we talk about and, and go gossip, um, that's not helpful. So we want to really, encourage you to go in and change your name. Um, you do that by, let's see here. I think if you click on participants, then you can click on your name and there's a thing that says more and that is where you should be able to go on and change your name if that is something that you want to do to give yourself a little more anonymity. Um, we are going to do a little bit of a role play conversation. Somebody asked about that. So here you go. Um, this is your information before we get into our breakout rooms, we're going to do this. So let's see, Andrea and Jerry and Michelle, do two of you want to do this role play or do you want me to be part of it? How do you want to do this? Who's up for it? Well, I was trying to find Michelle. <laughs> I was going to let Andrea and Jerry volunteer themselves. They're pawning oh. it off. <laughs> can I be, can I be the kid? No, oh, I want to be the kid. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Andrea, you're going to be the teen. Uh, how old are you? I am um, 13. Okay. And 13. Jerry, you are the adult. Okay. <laughs> no one's ever said that before. That's Just really for right weird. now. We'll consider you an Thank adult. You. And um, so what is Jerry, since you're, you're the adult, what is the situation mm -hmm. here? Have you, um, you know, um, let's see, how about there was a school incident um, and uh, my student just came home from middle school and, and I heard about the incident. So I just want to talk about some stuff. Okay. All right. Go for it. Sweet. Hey, Andrea, how was school? Actually, stop. No. Hi, Andrea. How are you? Okay, I guess. <laughs> That's perfect. That sounds like my my 15-year-old. Hey, I just wanted to touch base with you. Um, I got the text message and the email from the district, and they said that there was an incident at school that involved substances. And and I know we've had these conversations before and we're gonna to continue to have these conversations because they're really important because your mom and I are super, um, super uh, invested in making sure that you're healthy. Uh, but I just wanted to, to know 
that, um, you know, it, when you're at school and there's a circumstance like this, what I've found in doing the work that I do and, and just being a teenager is that a lot of times some of the pressure that you'll see to use substances doesn't come from people you don't know. It's going to come from people that you're friends with, right? They're going to be in a circumstance where they're, they're kind of, um, you know, they're kind of influencing you to make decisions about substance use. And I just want you to know that you can always use your mom and I as a way to get out of that right? Tell them whatever it is that you have to tell them. Um, tell them about your genetics and making sure that they know that if you use substances, your father will put you into substance use disorder treatment for free all over the state of Washington because he can, right? Um, yeah. and, and so whatever it is that you have to, um, you know, to tell somebody to make sure it's hard to say no to people that you don't know. It's really hard to say no to people that you do know. Um, so I just want you to be aware of that. And again, we'll have other conversations about that. Um, and I hope it doesn't happen for you. I hope your friends are making good choices, but you know. I didn't use anything. I was with Sarah and she pulled out a vape and started vaping and I got troubled just because I was with her. What a dork. <laughs> well, I hope Sarah is getting some information and I will get you some information about vaping too because it's a really, really dangerous activity and nicotine is so addicting. I just want you to have all the information that you need to make good decisions. Okay. And scene. That is so much harder to do when you're role playing versus my kid. So since I do work in behavioral health, my child and I have had that conversation about him going to treatment for the rest of his life <laughs> all the time. And he just goes, I'll go to treatment for the rest of my life. I know. And right. then he walks away. <laughs> so one thing in observing this and thinking how it would play out in probably real life is... Andrew would probably have interjected in there somewhere or like, you know, given more body language, like annoyance or whatever, you may get the eye roll, but Always. You know, that's okay. Your kids are not going to be like, thank you, dad, for telling me this information. <laughs> thank you, mom. I so appreciate it. You know, exactly. we still have to have these conversations. And, mm -hmm. and I would say also in there, like it's helpful to just ask some questions and give pause, like, tell me your side what you know what do you think about this to to get them to talk also sometimes they're not going to say a single word other times they will pipe in um like andrea you're like it wasn't me i didn't do anything you know yeah. and sometimes that's going to be their answer even if they did do something but mm -hmm. yeah. it. Indeed. yeah open-ended questions um, things that are that they're going to have to walk through again. Role play is is kind of difficult, but right. thinking about conversations I have with my young person, it's you know it's really kind of the motivational interviewing stuff like that won't let you off the hook. So tell me about this, right? Or um, you know, I heard you say X, Y, and Z. Tell me a little bit more about that. I'm kind of confused, and and really allow them to think about what they're what they're saying and, and, and what's behind it and having to walk you through the whole thing. Yeah, it's, it's I, weirder to do role plays. <laughs> I wanna comment on one thing that I noticed, which is of course in a situation like this, we as parents wanna get really con controlling and just grab our kids by the shirt and be like, exactly. don't ever do this. <laughs> and you know, anytime we get into a power struggle with our kids, they will show us who's really in charge of their decisions. And the answer is always that it's them. And so, you know, rather than falling into the trap of, you know, Jerry saying, you can never do this. I don't allow you, right? Like mm -hmm. that's, the kid will be like, watch me. <laughs> exactly. um, that, that you, you know, just said, like, it's really important that you have information to make good decisions and your health is important to me. And I will always advocate for your health. And he just stayed in his lane, you know, influencing what he can. And one thing also I've been talking with some parents about this week is if you do find that your 
your child is doing something, you found a vape or dab or something and, um, or alcohol, um, you don't have to have the answers right then and there. A lot of parents are like, oh my gosh, what do I do right in this moment? Sometimes you can acknowledge what's going on and say, I need to really think about how we're gonna handle this. Um, you know, I'll get back to you tomorrow. It doesn't have to be an immediate consequence or solution or fix it. Um, an acknowledgement in a calm way and say, we're going to come back to this. And that's where the, you know, consults with all of us in the schools, BHSSs and, and prevention intervention specialists, that's exactly what we're here for. And so, you know, to help support you in, in having those conversations, um, as well as, you know, some of the resources that we're sending you with um, fabulous websites that actually give you synopses, scenarios um, of exactly this role playing and how to, you know, how to do these conversation starters and things. So please do check those out. Mm -hmm. That's great to know. So if they find something's going on, they can reach out to you to, to know yes. how to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, so um, that was very helpful. Let me share my screen once more because there's a lot of stuff that we are doing for the community. Um, and again, it's what everybody needs and wants. So if there's ever anything that you feel like we should be doing, please let us know and we will um, you know, do our best to accommodate that. So tons of resources. Do not think that you are alone in this. We have so many resources in our community and just you know, reach out to the Balance of Mind team if you don't know what the resources are or to the YES team. There are just so many options. You do not have to go through this alone, um, nor does your teen. And so all of, there's a lot of resources up here, I know, but we will put those in the Balance of Mind Facebook group and on our page somewhere so that you can access those. Um, so we did that. We are going to follow up with an email that will give you some of these resources as well and kind of a recap of what we talked about. And make sure that you um, join us on the Facebook group because that's where we're gonna be putting lots of information, not just about this, but about what's going on in the community and other supportive um, memes and information. So you'll find that very helpful. And that's balance in mind if you do a search for that. The last thing is we are um, powered by the Lake Washington Schools Foundation and they're in the middle of their campaign. And what is it called, Val? I forgot the name. All in for kids. All in for kids. So if you want to donate to this cause and help us to continue to support the community and bringing mental health awareness and resources to the forefront, um, you can go to this tinyearl.com BIM donate. I believe that's what it says. My screen's covered up over there. So yes. Yep. So, and we will end with a quote here before we kind of close up shop for the night. Um, it, I know that there's a lot of heavy stuff going on in the world and with substance abuse, so many times the parents, we think that we have all this control, but we don't have a ton of control. Um, so this, this quote kind of sums it up. Parents can only give good advice or put them on the right paths, but the final forming of a person's character lies in their own hands. This is a quote by Anne Frank. We can do the best that we can, but ultimately our children make their decisions. We just have to be there to support them through it. On that note, that's it for tonight. And I hope you'll join us for our next parent chat, which is in two weeks. And Val, what is the um, topic of that one? Um, the topic of that one is on the 21st, and it is about um, helping kids with special needs at home while they're doing remote learning. And I also want to put a plug into um, our November parent chats. We have two of them. It's a two-part series. It's on helping your kids navigate difficult issues and um, difficult emotions, and we'll be looking at anxiety and stress and um, depression and grief. Excellent. So I hope we'll see you there for that. And on that note, good night, everybody. And thanks for joining us. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.